Good morning. Can you hear me? The uh, passage today is from 1 John chapter 3, uh, verse 4 through 10. I'll give you a second to flip to it. Okay. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born to God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep sinning, because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God, and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. This is the word of God. Thank you, Juliet. Brittany, Brittany, Brittany. It was my idea to ask her to do announcements once in a while, and it's like, it's good. She's good. She, like, warms up the crowd. It's like, gets people relaxed and everything before the pastor comes out and talks about sin today, right? We're talking about sin, so she, she loosened you up so that you don't get too tense and everything today. But we're really glad that you're here. How many of you are here for Isaac? Isaac. Isaac is getting baptized today. We've got family here, and really, this is all family, right? So we're going to celebrate. <laughs> Amen. And, and uh, what Marissa was saying as I was talking to her, is like, about a year ago, he was talking about getting baptized. I like to get baptized. And, and at eight years old, it's like, okay, talked about it, met with Nancy, and, and he didn't really push it or anything. And time has gone by. It's like, bugging mom and dad a little more and I think I'm ready for it and it's just really cool to see how as young people as we raise raise our kids when we get the idea that we're a sinner and that we need a savior right and who Jesus is and and a lot of times it's around that age around eight nine years old where we start to grasp those things right uh, we are going to talk about in the message we're going to talk about baptism a little bit I want you I want you to to know that we highly value baptism. Um, it doesn't make you a Christian. Jesus makes you a Christian. But uh, sometimes we, we kind of pass over baptism and we, we talk about just, just pray a prayer or ask Jesus into your heart. And really he says, I want you to give your whole life to me, right? I want you to, I want you to repent of your sins. I want you to to, to give your allegiance over to me. That's what Isaac's doing today. This is a big deal. This is the most important decision of his life. More than choosing a job, more than choosing who he's going to marry, where he's going to live, it's deciding to follow Jesus with his life. And that might be you today too. So think about it. Think about it. At the end of the service, um, if you haven't been baptized and you're a believer, you, you believe in Jesus Christ, you want to follow him, uh, let us know after the service, and the water will still be there after Isaac gets baptized, and we would love to do that. Um, which we'll have to watch because it, this would be cool. It's like, come over for a donut, and then we'll baptize you afterwards. Like, make sure you get your donut. No. Uh, yeah, so there, it could be a fun morning this morning. It will be a fun morning. Amen, Amen? right? It's, it's always a good morning. I don't know, I don't know wh where you're at right now. I don't know if you're, like, hurting. I don't know if you're sad. I don't know if you're depressed. I don't know if you were drug here. I don't know if I don't know that I don't know what's going on, but it's a good day because one, you're breathing. God got you up. Two, what else, Kenny? I have two people waiting for. Okay. One of them said, "I you did." He quit getting their family and problem. And the other one is in Florida. I've been trying to get over. And I don't know what happened to that part, but I want to thank for two people. All right, Gloria and who was the other one? Christine's uh, family. Christine's family. Okay, let's pray as we get ready to get into the message. Uh, God, I thank you so much for 
being our God and being, you're always here for us. You, uh, you never let us down. God, we do lift up Christine's family. We lift up Gloria to you. God, we lift up Gwen Koch uh, in the hospital. We lift up Charles, uh, who's in the hospital, Hernandez. Uh, God, uh, so many people that, that, uh, that just, they need your healing touch, God. And God, there, there are people that they just don't know you and maybe they don't have hope at all. They're, uh, they're looking for the answers of life. God, I pray this morning that today, whoever's here would know that you um, love us and you have hope for us, you have life for us. God, I pray that you uh, would watch over my words, that it would be, cl- they would be clear, they would be what you would want me to say. And God, thank you for your holy word that's perfect, that we get to look into and we get to not just admire, not just appreciate, but we get to um, just bow down before your holiness, before your lordship, and follow what every you call us to do. So, Father, I just pray that you just open up our hearts to receive, to, to be able to follow after you. Thank you for loving us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're in 1 John. We'll be there uh, in 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John through August. Uh, the month of August. So we like to go through books of the Bible just so we can follow the thought so we don't take things out of context, right? So we're seeing how the, the flow of something goes. And so we're in 1 John chapter 3. And one of the big things that, that John is trying to get across is that you can be sure of your salvation. You can have assurance of going to heaven, not just going to heaven, right? The, the, goal, the goal isn't just to get to heaven, right? The goal is to have Jesus, and he's coming again, and he's going to make a new heavens, a new earth, and it's going to be awesome. And he wants you to be a part of that. And he doesn't want you just to guess if you're going to be there. He wants you to know. All other religions are trying to do enough to, to make sure you're going to make it, right? Christianity is different. Totally different. Christianity is you couldn't possibly do enough. You couldn't possibly do enough to get there. That's why there's a Savior. That's why Jesus came. He did everything for us on our behalf, so we trust in him. And I know it sounds like a cop-out. It sounds too easy. It's like, wait, what? Well, here's where it comes in for us. He says, just say yes to me, trust me, but you need to die to yourself. Jesus is not someone you just add to your life. He isn't just, "Ah, I'll give him Sundays. He, He wants every day. He wants your whole life. He wants your... He wants your wallet. He wants your paycheck. He wants your family. He wants your house. He wants you to give everything up for him. And then what happens is he gives it back to you in much better ways, in redeemed ways, right? Here's how you use your money. Here's how how your family is going to be just living a thriving life if you just follow me. So Jesus really is the best decision, but let's, let's just make sure we understand that it isn't just easy believism. It isn't just... Ah, just say yes to Jesus and go on your way. It's, so Isaac, it's going to be really important that his family and all of us come alongside him and help him to keep growing in the Lord and keep continuing after the Lord. That's another theme that we see in, in 1 John is continuing after the Lord. Uh, before, before we get into this, I want to, I want to share that uh, we are all in a broken world, and we know that, whether you're a believer here or not, you know that we're in a broken world. And we have hurts, hang-ups, and habits, right? And that we need help with those things. So we are going to, I want to invite you to something that we're going to do this summer. Actually, we just came up with it uh, Friday. Let's, let's, have a, let's have a group that meets every Friday through the summer. So starting uh, July 7th, we're going to have a small group that meets here Fridays at 6 p.m. And it's going to be going through a small group study of how Jesus is healing or how he does heal our hurts, hang-ups, and habits. And we're going to look deeply into where are we struggling? Where are our hurts? Where where are our even addictions? Uh, Where are the things that we're really struggling with? And how does Jesus answer those things? And we're going to do that together. We're going to, we're going to watch a video together, and we're going to break up men and women together just, just to study, just to, just to look at 
some biblical principles in that. So if, if that's something you want to do, it's just a two-month thing, and if you can't make it a certain Friday, that's all right. But we do ask that you commit to the very beginning, uh, just so you understand, you know, we don't want people adding in August, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to build on each other. So if that's something you can do, um, let me know so we have enough food, because we also eat dinner for that. It's also doing this. It's, preparate, it's, it's for us, but it's preparing us to be able to launch a uh, Celebrate Recovery in the fall. We want to have, we wanna have a full-blown program of Celebrate Recovery uh, that is going to help. It, it's for everybody. Celebrate Recovery isn't just if you have substance abuse addiction. Um, probably one-third of the people that go to Celebrate Recovery have that kind of background, but it is for that. It, but it's for everything. If you've been hurt, if you need healing, if you're struggling. Um, so in the fall, we're going to invite the community to, to times. And we'll, we'll let you know more about that. We don't know the launch date. We don't know the times and all that. But right now, if you want to be part of a small group experience, Friday night starting July 7th. All right. So uh, today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at things that don't go together. Things that don't go together. Let me give you some things that don't go together. Orange juice and toothpaste don't <laughs> go together, right? Bathtubs and toasters do not do not toast make toast while you're in the bathtub. Um, forks and power outlets, forks and power outlets. How many times do we have to tell you don't they don't go together? Um, this one I have personal experience with: your hand and a beehive. Uh, <laughs> So as a painter, I remember a time taking a, one of those light things, off, the porch light um, cover fixture off, holding it in my hand while I'm painting around it, not knowing there's a whole beehive in that thing. And I'm just casually painting and then all of a sudden getting stung and looking, oh my goodness, I'm holding bees in my hand. They don't go together, do they? How about your foot and a Lego? Don't go. <laughs> Have you, have you been there? Have you de- oh, gosh, yeah. Try to sneak around in your kid's room and then step on a Lego with your bear. Slugs and salt don't go together, right? So if you like slugs and you see a hungry slug, don't feed it salt. If you don't like slugs, feed it salt. <laughs> it works. It really works. So today, though, we're going to talk about, seriously, things that don't go together, child of God and sin. They don't go together, right? Um, being a child of God is incompatible with the practice of a life of sin. If Jesus came, and he did, came to take away our sin, and he came to destroy the works of the devil, and make us God's children, how could we possibly go on living in sin? So we're going to look at reasons we can't keep sinning as Christians. Number one, Jesus came to take away our sins. We see this in the passage. Jesus came to take away our sins, verses four through six. Everyone who commits sin practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed so that he might take away sins, and there is no sin in him. In who? Jesus, right? He's talking about Jesus. He came, he's the one that has no sin, and he takes away all sin. Everyone who sins has not seen him or known him. So uh, John lists the biggest problem that we have and the only solution. What's the biggest problem that we have? Sin, right? What's the solution? What's the only solution? Jesus, God, right? Jesus is your only solution for your biggest problem. That's what John is, is saying here. He came to take away our sins. We need to realize how big of a problem our sin is because I think sometimes we make it little or we kind of redefine it. And it's like, ah, eh, it's not so bad. Here, John calls sin what? How does he define sin? Lawlessness, right? Lawlessness. It's like, you can't tell me what to do, right? That's what sin is, is God who created everything and has a plan for everything, has the best way for us to live our lives, and we say, yeah, whatever. I, I know better how to, I'm going to try this. I don't want to listen to you. Really, that's what sin is, and really, that's what we've all done. And, and some of you are going, no, that's not what. It really is what you've done. You've been a rebel. Here, here's even taking another step is we've committed treason. 
We've committed treason against the high king of heaven, the one who created everything, who's the king of everything, and we've committed treason against him. Guess what the penalty for treason is? It's death. Because if we don't want to follow him, then the only other possibility is life without him, which is death. It's a separation from him. So sin is serious. Sin, sin is very serious. Um, because of the problem, the problem is so great, we need a great savior. Jesus came to take away our sins. In John chapter one, verse 29, John the Baptist is baptizing people and he sees Jesus coming. What, remember what he said? He goes, look, the lamb of God, who what? Takes away the sins of the world, right? This is before Jesus came and before he died on the cross and rose again. But John the Baptist is recognizing the Savior, and he says, that's the Lamb of God. Why would he say Lamb of God? He's the sacrifice, right? Jesus is the final sacrifice, the one who's going to take away the sins of the world, and that's what he did. That's what he came to do. Jesus died on the cross carrying away our sins, and he forgives the sins of all who trust him. He can do that. Why? Because he never sinned. He came to live. He could have just come as an adult, right, and... And the next day, just poof, became an adult and then died on the cross. But there's several things he couldn't do. You know, one, he was training people when he came. Also, he lived a perfect life from, from baby to adult. He lived, he's the only one that's lived a perfect life, right? So he's the only one who could pay for our sins because he's the only one who is perfect. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What that's saying is, Jesus had no sin, and God put our sin on him. When Jesus went to the cross, it was a great transfer. It was, it was taking our sin, and we got his righteousness. If you trust in him, you have his righteousness. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says, we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way that we are, yet without sin. Your Savior, Jesus Christ, was tempted. He went through things. That he struggled. He, he went through uh, loneliness. He went through uh, even anxiety, right? And you go, what do you mean anxiety? When he, was at, when he was in the garden before dying on the cross, he went through intense anxiety where he's sweating sweating as drops of blood as he's thinking about what he's going to go through for for the world jesus went through all kinds and then he went through the torture he went through everything and he didn't sin even up on the cross he didn't sin he even said things like forgive them they don't know what they're doing jesus was perfect in how he lived look at verse six it says this is this is important because some of you it might have might catch you up on on this and and give you some some troubles it says everyone who remains in him does not sin hmm, okay shoot <laughs> everyone who sins has not seen him or known him and that known him is more than just knowing about him it's experiential knowledge of him is if, if you sin, you, you're, not, you're not a believer. And you're going, wait a minute. This doesn't, this doesn't make sense because I believe in him, I know him, and yet I sinned this morning on my way to church, right? It's like, I, I've sinned yesterday and the day before. How is this even possible? Because Jesus doesn't have any sin, those who live in him won't keep on sinning. If Jesus came to take away sin, how could we keep living in sin, right? If, if his whole point was to take away our sin, why would we go into our sin again if that's what he came to take away? So you go, but I sin. Well, let's jump back a page, just turn a page, uh, first, uh, back a page, 1 John 1, 8, and let's just remind us uh, what John has said already, because this is important. We've got to take the Bible into context. He says, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If you say you don't have sin, you're a liar, right? It's like, well, I can't go to church. It's like, 
I'm a sinner. It's like, well, join the rest of us because we're all, we're really good at putting a good face on, aren't we? When we come to church, we're really good at making sure, hey, kids, make sure there's no arguing. All right, okay, then you'll have, you get a donut with the pastor if you don't argue. And we have sin, right? We have, if people could just, and that's why Celebrate Recovery is going to be all about just like, it's okay for other people to see my stuff because Jesus does and Jesus wants to heal me. And I'm gonna be with a group of people that I trust that can help me through these things. So we have sinned. It's a lie to say that we haven't sinned or we don't sin still, even as Christians. So what is he saying? Um, The key is looking at the verb tense here. And you go, well, I don't know the verb tense here. You can go, anybody, you don't have to go to Bible college to know this. You can see the Greek or you can... Uh, their study helps with this, but the original language is in Greek, and the idea of the sin isn't just a one-time thing that you don't sin. It's an ongoing, it's a present verb that talks about an ongoing sin. So some of your translations say that. Now, in the, the Christian standard doesn't. It's, it just says, everyone who sins has not seen him or known him. If you have the Christian standard version, though, it does have a letter that you can look at the footnotes. That's why I love in, in these. It, it says, or who keeps on sinning. So some of your translations, the NIV, I think, does a good job with this. It says, I think it says continues to sin or keeps on sinning. ESV, I think, says that too. So I, I think one of, if you don't want to get into the Greek and Hebrew, at least look at different translations. If you have just one translation, look at other translations and see how they're translated. The idea is if if you are a Christian, because Jesus came to take away sins, you're not gonna continue in a lifestyle of sin, right? That's not gonna be your habit anymore. That's not gonna be your character anymore. It doesn't mean you're not gonna sin because John already says you're gonna sin. What do you do when you sin? What are you supposed to do? Confess it, confess it, because one, he knows already, so you're not telling him something new. Oh man, how I hated that with, I mean, Kent got in a lot more trouble than me, but, uh, but uh, I hated like if my parents didn't know something, <laughs> it was like, oh gosh, wait till they find this one out. But your father in heaven knows everything. He even knows the things you don't even know or remember, and he loves you. So why would we confess? Why would we go to him? It's because he's not sitting there waiting to whack you across the head right? He's sitting there waiting for you just to confess so he can forgive you. That's what he wants you to do. He loves to forgive. He loves to show kindness. He loves to uh, bring you to that next place where you can learn obedience from him. So he, he disciplines the ones he loves. So the idea is the lifestyle or practice of sin. Christian, you're a new creation because of Christ in you. He has taken away your sin. You have new freedom to be who God created you to be. So if he forgave you a sin, it isn't living there anymore or the guilt or the shame, right? It isn't if, if, if you're being reminded of that guilt and shame of things you're already forgiven of, guess who that's doing that? It's, the, it's Satan, it's you too. It's like sometimes we feel like his grace is so good, I have to do something to earn it right? It's just too good. I have to do something. I have to, I have to pray more prayers. I have to go, I have to serve at Free Food Friday. I have to go to more church services, make sure I'm here early, fold the bulletins. I guess we don't fold the bulletins, but do whatever, find things to do. And, and the whole point is he forgives you. That gives you a new freedom to walk in a new way of life, right? And to walk in freedom and to not walk back in the past. That's not what we're about. We're about walking ahead. He's forgiven you of that. And confess those things as you're aware of those, but he's forgiven you. Sin isn't your boss anymore. That's the point. Jesus came to take away your sin, so don't be bossed around by sin. It can't tell you what to do. If you're a Christian, it isn't your boss anymore. Because you are in Christ, Christ is in you, you might fall into sin, but you don't walk in sin. Does that make sense? You might fall. You might do something and, oops, I slipped, but you don't walk in that. You, in fact, if you're a believer, what happens is the Holy Spirit starts to convict you. It's like, man, I don't even like that anymore. Have you, have you noticed that? It's like, man, the things I used to do, when I do them now, I don't even find enjoyment in those things. Amen. <laughs> That's good. It's a good thing because those are things that will harm you. Um, and there's things that you enjoy now that you never enjoyed before that are good for you. Right? And that's another thing that God does with us. 
But because you're in Christ and Christ is in you, uh, don't walk in sin. Sin won't be your habit or lifestyle. Now, in the Old Testament, there's a lot of animals being sacrificed, aren't there? There's a lot of blood on the altar. There's a lot of animals being um, sacrificed for sins. And they couldn't take away sin. Animals couldn't t- take away sin. They would point forward to a final answer, but the, re- the reason they had to keep coming back and doing more sacrifices, right, and, and sacrifice after sacrifice is because they didn't take away sin, but it reminded them that their sin deserved death. Our sin is grotesque. Our sin is disgusting. Our sin is treason. Our sin is lawlessness. Our sin is all these things, but God is making a way, and he made a way. And in the Old Testament, he's paving a way. And there's a day called the Day of Atonement. And on that Yom Kippur, right, Day of Atonement. And on that Day of Atonement, the priest, here's one of the things that the, the, the priest would do, is he would take two goats, and he would cast lots. It's kind of like throwing dice and, and cast lots for these goats. The unlucky goat would get killed, right? The unlucky goat would be sacrificed and would die for the sins in place of the people of Israel who sinned and even the priest. The priest actually had another sacrifice that he would go through for, for himself, but the blood, of the, the blood of the goat, that goat would be sprinkled in the, um, in the temple, in the, in the tabernacle and then later the temple. And it's because we deserve death. And so God made a way, provision for animals to be sacrificed throughout the year, year after year after year after year until Jesus. There was another goat, a little luckier than that goat. And that goat is called the scapegoat. That's where we get the idea, scapegoat. And what happened is he, the priest would put his hands on the head of that goat and start confessing the sins of Israel. Sexual immorality, lying, thievery, gossip, disobedience to parents, adultery. He would just just name the sins of Israel. And what was happening is God was transferring the sins from Israel onto that goat. And that goat was sent out into the wilderness to show that that's what God is doing with our sins. That he's taking our sins away from us. And that's exactly what Jesus did, isn't he? It's, it's all pointing to Jesus. When Jesus died on the, cross, he, cro- on the cross, he's like the first goat that was sacrificed for our sins. He died in our place. But he's also like that second goat, the scapegoat, where he takes our sins away from us. In fact, Psalm says this, Psalm uh, uh, 103 verse 12 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Isn't that awesome? East and west aren't gonna meet. Your sins, you're not gonna meet your sins anymore. He's taken them away. Amen to that? Amen to that. That's, that's, we should sing a song right now, Kent. We should just get up and sing a song. That, you know, sometimes, don't you feel like that? It's like you, you're reading the word and something so glorious comes up and you go, I just need to sing right now. I need to stop reading and I just need to pray or I need to cry or I need to, I need to, do, I need to repent or I need to, do, I need to meditate on this. But man, when we come to church sometimes or we're in our devotion, it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, I'm forgiven my sins. It's like, wait a minute, let's pause forgiven. That means there's no record of wrong anymore. He's not the one bringing it up. If anyone's bringing it up, it's you or other people, right? It's like, I know what you did. Well, I, Jesus doesn't, He's, he forgot it. He just, he said it's not, it's not, a, it's not a factor anymore. Uh, Satan will do that. He, he loves to accuse. He loves to bring up those things. And we believe him. That's the sad thing. We listen. Why do we listen to the devil? I don't even talk to him. Some people talk to him. It's like, I don't even want to give him the time of day. I want to recognize that he's there, but I'm not, I'm not speaking to demons or, or the devil. It's like they don't deserve my time. I got time for Jesus and for people. That's what I got time for. I don't have time for any principalities or anything. I know that they're after me, but here's, here's, what I'm, here's where I'm coming from is I'm not worried about them because Satan's got, or Jesus has me covered from Satan. Jesus has a covering over believers where, you, okay, he's attacking, but what can he do? What can he do? Nothing, nothing. He can discourage you. Oh, well, okay, I'm gonna get in the word. 
or I'm going to call a friend. I'm going to talk to Jesus. I'm going to, don't give Satan more credit than he, you need to. Because Jesus took away our sins, we don't have to and we shouldn't live in sin anymore. A life living in sin and living in Jesus is an oxymoron. It doesn't make sense. Okay, the second reason uh, we can't keep sinning as Christians is Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to destroy the works of the devil. So not only is sin my enemy, but so is the devil. The devil goes by other names, right? What else does he go by? Satan, that's another name, right? Beelzebub, yeah. There's other names, right? Devil is one that's used here. He's an accuser. He's an adversary. He is a, he's a created being. So that's something that should bring comfort to you as well. He's a created being, so he doesn't have... It isn't like yin and yang with, with Jesus and Satan. It isn't like, who's going to win? I don't know. It's like, no, Jesus created Satan. And uh, there's a lot of questions I have about that too. <laughs> but, but Jesus is the creator. Satan is a created being. He's a fallen angel that we see in, in Scripture and he's the one where sin comes from, right? We see in the, in the story in, in Genesis that he's the one that deceives Adam and Eve and, and they eat of the forbidden fruit, the forbidden tree. So Satan, Satan is real. He's a created being. And he got, he got uh, them to eat. How many trees were forbidden? Isn't that something? How many other trees could they eat from? Anything else? Isn't it, so a lot of times when we look at God's commands, we go, oh, you're so restrictive. Oh, man, there's so many things I can't do. It's like I would have so much more fun if I could just do it my way. And, and it's like he has so much for you in me. He has so much for you. And those boundaries, those things that he says don't, it's forbidden, it's for your good. It's for my good, and we need to trust him instead of going, oh, I'm going to find a way I can still do this and still be a Christian, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find a way. There's got to be a loophole. It's like maybe, and here's, oh gosh, here's, here's where it goes nowadays. It's like, well, we can't be real clear on Bible passages because they can be interpreted a lot of different ways. It's like, oh, for goodness sakes, so... There are some things that are hard to be clear on, right? So if I said, uh, how many of you are pre-millennial, amillennial, post-millennial? Okay, we're going to, and some of you don't even know, and that's probably better that way. But it, we might have different, even within the eldership, we might have different versions on when Jesus comes back, how is that going to look? What's going to happen? It's like, okay, there's some passages we're going, hmm. I think this is what they're saying. But there are very clear passages in the Bible, right? Like, you are a sinner. That's not one, like, it's up for interpretation. It's like, what does it mean, sinners? Like, that could be, like, your truth is your truth, and my truth is my truth. It's like, no. That, so that's what's going on right now, is people are reinterpreting Scripture so that you don't even trust this anymore. This is God's Word. And we've got to trust His Word and go, you know what's best, and if you say don't do something... I might be going, ah, it seems like it still could be good, but I'm going to trust you on that. Adam and Eve should have trusted God on that. They should have said, you know what, that's one tree. We got all the rest of the devil, take a hike, right? But they didn't. They listened to the devil. They listened to him. And here's what he does today. Here's some of the things he does today. He causes us to take sin lightly. The devil does. He says, uh, we, we say things like, I can still do this. Why do, we, why do we do this? Why do we see how close to hell we can get as Christians? Why do we see how close to sin that we can get and still be Christians? Instead of, I'm going to see how close to Jesus I can get, right? And I don't care if people call me a goody two-shoes or whatever. It's like, I don't care. It's like, I want to see how close to Jesus I can get, not as close to, to Satan or hell as I can get, right? Or we do things like, it's not really a sin. It's more of a mistake, it is a mistake. It's definitely a mistake, but it's definitely rebellion. It's definitely lawlessness. It's definitely treason. Or we say things like, it, we're all just human, or it's not that bad, or it's not hurting anybody else, right? If it just, if it just deals with me. So the devil has all kinds of ways to trick us and deceive us to get us to, to follow after sin, or he causes us to redefine sin right? We take our cues from the culture on what is good and evil. Uh-oh. 
Uh oh, that's not a good idea, is it? There's a lot of ungodly messages in our culture. Have you noticed? <laughs> Have you noticed? Be aware of what is of God and what is of the devil. Be aware. Keep your eyes open. Does that look like something of God or does that look like not something of God? Verse 7 says, let no one deceive you. So God's given you discernment. God's given you a discernment to, to know what's going to be good, what's going to be of him, and what's not going to be of him. Parents, can I say this? I will so I won't ask for permission, but parents, you need to know what your kids are being taught. If you're not aware of the curriculum your kids are being taught, uh, you're, you're being ignorant. You really are. I've been ignorant. We've all been ignorant. Check the curriculum out. When there's, a, when there's an assembly at school, Make sure you know what that's all about because the devil loves to indoctrinate your kids. You got, nah, not the devil. It's just the school. It's just, it's just teachers. Well, the devil's really tricky and he uses people in authority that might not even know that they're being used, right? Most likely not, but, but there are agendas and those agendas are coming from the evil one or they're coming from God. So be aware be alert of what's going on and don't just trust everything. When you're on the internet, not everything you read on the internet is true, right? Not everything that you, uh, not everything that you watch is good for you, right? It's like, well, I might as well watch this. It's on, other people are watching it. Maybe it's not for you. Be discerning. Don't let anyone deceive you. John uses the present tense uh, on this as well. Just like he uses the present tense for sin, he's talking about, that you don't keep on sinning. He's saying this, this about um, your not letting others deceive you. He says, keep on not letting people deceive you. That's what he's saying. It isn't just a one time, oh, I didn't, they didn't deceive me. It's like, no, right, continue. Continue today, tomorrow, the next day. Be vigilant and don't let anyone deceive you. The one who does what is right is righteous, he says, right? The one who does what is right is righteous. And he's not saying, because we've already seen this in 1 John, it isn't you do right so you become right, right? It isn't, that's not the gospel. The gospel isn't try to be righteous so that you can be righteous. The gospel is flipped upside down where it's God makes you righteous so now you need to live righteous. That's your identity. Christian, you need to remember your identity. You're a child of God. You're righteous. You are, you have his righteousness. It isn't like, well, I'm not that righteous. Well, yeah, you are because he gave you his righteousness. So it's nothing that you did except that you said yes to Jesus. So if you're righteous and holy, live righteous and holy. Live out of your identity. Jesus is our righteousness. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Isn't that beautiful? It's like he did that for me and he did that so, so I wouldn't have to be in charge anymore. He, his life, my life is his now. It belongs to him. Don't be deceived into thinking you can practice sin and be righteous before God. The devil is a sinner who has been defeated. Jesus came to take away sin and destroy the works of the devil. Now, I, I wrote this down because this is a quote from John Piper, and he says, I, I just love how he says this. This is a Christmas message he gave. It's like, why did Jesus come? Why Christmas? And he says, Christmas is because God aims to destroy something. <laughs> I love that. It's like, we don't hear that Christmas message often. It's like, he aims to destroy something. It is God's infiltration of rebel planet Earth on a search and destroy mission. The Son of God appeared, right? He came, searched out, and destroyed the works of Satan. He blew them up. I love, that's why Christmas it isn't just a cute little baby. We need to, uh, that's, that's awesome. We need to give gifts to each other. It's like, no, he came to take out the devil, right? He came to take a hike, devil. And because of what Jesus did, not only at the incarnation, Christmas is awesome, but so is Easter. So is Good Friday and Easter. 
is he came so that he could die on the cross to take our sins. He came so he could not only die, but he can rise from the dead and, and defeat death and defeat sin and Satan. And so here's the deal. Satan is defeated. We're not waiting for Satan to be defeated, but he is defeated. It's kind of like D-Day and V-Day, right? D-Day, oh man, we got this war. We got it. But not until V-Day was the war totally over where the surrender happened. D-Day is when Jesus died on the cross. It's over. Satan's still running amok. He's still doing things. How many of you can testify to that? It's like, man, he's, he's always bugging me and I hate it. I hate that he bugs me. I hate that I'm a pastor. Oh, here's another thing I was going to say, but I hate that I'm a pastor and I'm getting up in front of you and I'm not perfect. <laughs> I hate that. I was like, oh man, what am I, who am I to? So here's the thing is like, I'm not preaching me. That's, that's how I get up here. I'm not preaching me. I'm preaching him. And just like you're following him, I'm following him. Now, here's what I was going to say that I was just, thank you, Lord, if that's from you, but um, we compartmentalize sin. We say, you're a pastor. I can't believe you did. It's like, no, it's like, that's like, it doesn't matter, pastor or whoever. We shouldn't, no one should be involved in certain activities, right? So why do we think, oh, I can't believe a pastor did that. Well, it's like, no one should be doing certain things. Or another way we compartmentalize sin is like, hey, we're in a church. You can't do that here. It's like, you can't do that anywhere, right? It's like, there's, there's, if it's a sin, at all it's a sin everywhere uh, that would happen at youth group a lot it's like no no we're a, we're a youth group you can't do this it's like please you know i don't think he likes you doing that at school or at home either it's like don't don't cuss <laughs> don't be mean to each other all the time right so sin is it, the devil's so tricky but he's defeated he's defeated Jesus' death on the cross took away the penalty of your sin. You don't have to pay a penalty for your sin, right? The, the court session is over. You're freed. He, someone else took the penalty. It was Jesus. Now you're a child of God. Now you're a child of God. And Jesus took away the power of sin in your life so you can follow him. So he's not only taking care of the penalty of your sin, he's taking care of the power of sin so that you don't have to say yes to sin. Jesus came so that you can say no to sin. You have the power of the Holy Spirit in you. Yes, you can. You can say no to sin. You don't have to give in. You can follow him because he gave you the power and you, he gave you his life. Uh, when Jesus comes again, he's gonna take away the presence of sin forever. So he took care of the penalty. He's taking care of the power right now, sin, so I can say no to sin. But he's gonna take care of the presence of sin forever one day. That hasn't happened yet. Right? When Jesus comes again, it's going to be all good. He's going he's gonna to vindicate himself. It's going it, to be better than you've ever imagined, the new heavens and the new earth. Jesus defeated the devil at the cross, and that victory is for whoever will trust in Jesus and be born again. So that leads me to the last point. You, you, can't, you, can't, you can't fiddle around with sin and be a Christian. Your third, your lifestyle shows who you belong to. Your lifestyle shows who you belong to. Look at verses 9 and 10. Everyone who has been born of God does not sin. Okay? You go, wait a minute. But I do sin. Remember? Same thing. If you got the CSB, look at the footnotes there. The idea is doesn't keep on sinning. You don't have a lifestyle of sin. Because his seed remains, uh, his seed remains in him. He is not able to sin. Because he has been born of God. This is how God's children and the devil's children become obvious. Whoever does not do what is right is not of God, especially the one who does not love his brother or sister. Wow, and he gives an example. He talks about that love for each other, right? If we don't have that love, we're not really a believer. And he's gonna talk about that more next week. We're gonna look at love is more than just our words it's actions we're gonna look at how what what does it mean to actually love but but for right now your lifestyle shows who you belong to jesus changes everything doesn't he second corinthians five seventeen. if anyone is in christ he is what new creation you're a new creation jesus changes everything the old has passed away and the new has come God's children have experienced new birth. If you're a child of God, you're born again. So it's not like, are you a born again Christian? Those are the same. <laughs> if you're a Christian, you are born again. That's what scripture says. 
Uh, God, God's children have experienced new birth. If you are a child of God, you're born again. And, and John says this in his gospel, same John that wrote these letters wrote this in his gospel account of Jesus. He says in John 1, to all who did receive Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. He's saying if you trust in Jesus, you're born of God. You're born again. Believing in Jesus. So think about what's going on. Believing in Jesus, repenting of sin. And even, I'm gonna add, because the Bible does, we don't often do this. Not all churches do this. Believing, repenting, being baptized. And why would God, why would you, Kyle, why would you say baptism? Why isn't it just belief? Because baptism goes right along with belief. If, if you look through the book of Acts, it always goes with belief. It always goes with belief and repentance. It's being baptized. But, but you're not saved just because you get wet. Well, you're not saved just because you come to church. You're not saved because it's Jesus who saves you, right? But what's happening in baptism is you're showing a new birth. You're showing that I'm dying to myself. In fact, here's what Romans says. I'll just let you hear from Romans 6. Are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. So when Isaac's getting baptized, it isn't just, it isn't just oh, he's just, a, just an act of obedience. This is him saying, Jesus, I wanna give you my life and I wanna walk in newness of life with you. This is, I'm dying to myself and I'm living for you. If that's what you've done in baptism, remember that it, it wasn't the water that made you a Christian, right? It isn't, it isn't that. It isn't even really our words, it's, it's do you trust him with your heart? Because we could say the words, right? I won't do that again, all right. That made everyone jump. You woke up, good. Okay, welcome to North Hill Christian Church. Let me start my sermon. No, uh, so when, I don't remember what I was gonna say, but um, walk in newness of life. A child of God is repentant, is a, is a repentant, baptized believer in Jesus, all right? A repentant, baptized believer in Jesus. And if you haven't been baptized yet, maybe you've been a believer. We're not even going to say that you haven't been a Christian yet. It's like maybe no one ever really told you about immersion, about being baptized. We'd love to do that because Jesus wants you to. Jesus says, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. Right? So, so it, is, it is important that we do that. And so if you at all have said yes to Jesus and you haven't been baptized, we would love to, or maybe today you're, you're saying yes to Jesus for the first time. We would love to baptize you. You can do it later, right? In fact, Isaac, I think, wanted to get baptized like that day. Didn't you say that, Marissa? It was like a Thursday or something. It's like, I want to get baptized now. So, well, honey, uh, we're going to have some family gathering together on Sunday. That's going to be, but isn't that a great response it's like why not now I, I vote now and if that's you sometimes steve did that steve was came here in the middle it wasn't even a sunday steve came here and he's like, i want to get baptized like okay well, let's go fill the little baptistry up and, and baptize you so everyone born of god doesn't sin doesn't keep on sinning because god's seed remains in him it means the holy spirit has given a new nature to all who trust in jesus god's children don't practice sin because it's not our nature anymore that's the old life. That should encourage us and challenge us. Encourage you because you are a new creation. You don't have to go in those same ways anymore, right? And then when, when you do sin, quickly go to Jesus. Don't get down on yourself and it's like, oh, I'm probably not a Christian. No, just go to Jesus and repent and receive his forgiveness. But it should challenge us too, shouldn't it? To remain in him. Remain in him. Continue in him. Abide in him. Live in him. It's really, really important that you stay as close to Jesus as you can because the further we get away from Jesus, the more voices, other voices we hear, the more other things that we hear tempting us. So stick close to Jesus. How do we live our lives, or how we live our lives show who we belong to? There's two tests that he gives us that distinguish a child of God from a child of the devil. Do you do what's right, and do you love others? Those who hate sin and have been set free from the devil are born of God and do what is right and love others. 
So your behavior shows who you belong to, who your allegiance is to. Bob Dylan, the great uh, theologian, um, says you got to serve somebody, right? It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you got to serve somebody. You are a child of the most high God. Sin isn't your playground anymore, so don't play around with it anymore. Serious on that. And when I say that, understand I'm saying that to myself because I'm sick of sin in my life. Brings me to tears. Brings me to tears. I've been following God for 50 years almost, and I still listen to the evil one. I still listen to him. I still, it's like, I hear his little chatter, and I believe It's like, man, that flesh wants to keep coming back up, doesn't it? It's like, I just want it to end. I just want want to be following Jesus wholeheartedly. Man, don't we want that? Do you want that? Do you want to follow after Jesus? Are you sick of sin? Then let's stop it, right? And let's not okay it. Let's not redefine it. Let's not judge other people, too, for their sins. Let's understand that it's his kindness It's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. It's because God is approachable, because he brought us in, that we would even look at him, right? Because if he didn't have that, it would be, I can't even stand near him. He is so brilliant. He is so just. He is so holy. I can't even approach him. But he is approachable. Why? Because he came to us. Jesus laid down his rights and privileges as God. And he he didn't stop being God, but those rights and privileges as God, he stepped off the throne, became a baby, being nurtured by a 14, 15 year old girl, you know, just growing up, going through the things that we go through, going through puberty, going through all kinds of things that Jesus went through, why? Because he loves us and he knew we couldn't find a way to him, that he had to come to us. Your savior has come to save you from your sins. So Christian, Christian, remain in him. Remain in him. Understand, he took away your sins. He, he destroys the works of the devil and that he made you your child, his child. If you're not a Christian yet today, today is the day to give your life over to Jesus. I'm serious on that. I'm serious on that. Like someday, it would be awesome. But if, if you think you're ready at all, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to say, yes, I'm in, and you can be a child of God, right? And we want to talk to you about that. So here's why, here's, because we think that's serious, we're going to have a couple people up here to pray with you at the end of the service. You can message us anytime. You can call us. We have a new thing that, you know how we had a text line? Well, now we got a text line that's to our regular landline number. So 206-878-4740. If you need prayer, if you have a decision to make, you text that. You go, I don't want to call. Or it's 2 in the morning and you don't want to wake someone up. It's like text. We'll get a hold of you. So you can do that. But we're serious. It's so, so, so important that we decide today to follow Jesus. Amen? Okay, so now we're going to take communion. And if this is new to you, what this is, we're taking bread and a cup. It's actually a cracker and a cup. And, and Jesus took the Passover meal the day before he was crucified, the night before he was crucified, and he says, I, I, wanna, I want you to see something here. And he's talking to his disciples, and he says, I want you to see how I'm fulfilling all this. I'm fulfilling all the law and the prophets. And I've come to give my life as a, a ransom, as a sacrifice for sins. Whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup is going to proclaim my death until I come back. You're going to remember him. So what we're doing right now as believers, so if if you haven't got one of those, Dave or John will come up in a little bit and bring that to you. Uh, But we're going to remember Jesus. And as we take the bread and cup, let's not take our sins uh, lightly. Let's take it seriously. But let's take his forgiveness seriously as well. He forgives you. He loves you. He doesn't shame you. He wants to lift that away from you, but you gotta just confess that before him. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your grace and mercy in our lives because without that, we couldn't stand. Without that, we couldn't even approach you. But God, because of your loving kindness that lasts forever, you said, that you will continue to continue, continue to love us. Nothing can separate us from your love. God, I pray that as we take this bread and we take this cup that we remember 
the seriousness of our sin and the seriousness of the sacrifice on the cross that God you went to the very uh, you went to the very point of death to not just show us that you love us but to give us life to give us your righteousness to give us forgiveness of sins God thank you that Satan doesn't have to have a, any kind of rule over our lives thank you that you have more power and that you defeat everything that he tries to do God, I pray for anyone here that's making this decision today, God, that as they talk to you right now and just say yes to you, God, that they would confess uh, their need for you as their savior. Thank you that you're for all people. You're for everyone. We just thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.